What's the role of the critic in the American art community? Is the critic an arbiter of taste, a, a trendsetter? My guest on this edition of American Art Forum is Roger Kimball, a freelance critic from New York. Mr. Kimball writes on art and literature from several journals like The New Criterion and The American Scholar. But what is he really? A critic, is he a, a commentator on American culture or more than that? Join us for a discussion of art and criticism here on American Art Forum. From tradition to innovation, from colonial to contemporary, art historian Richard Love and his guests bring you the world of art on American Art Forum. Roger, how does one uh, go from studentship uh, to becoming a critic? Can, are there courses in college now which will give one the opportunity of becoming an instant professional critic? Yes, I th there are courses that build themselves as such, but um, I think that's uh, the wrong road to take. I think um, a combination of luck and hard work and um, some talent probably are, are the real ingredients. Well, we know you've got the talent. We know you've had the luck to, in working with someone such as Hilton Kramer for New Criterion. Uh, but there are other magazines uh, on culture which you also contribute to. Uh, one of them is uh, Common Commentary. Commentary magazine in New York, yes, and um, the American Scholar, as you mentioned, Architectural Record in New York, um, and I write for other other magazines as well. You are. I have followed your career uh, uh, somewhat. Um, this isn't the first time we've done this together, and uh, I know that architecture is. Is it fair to say a favorite of yours? Well, it's um, certainly uh, one of my interests. I've been writing about architecture a good deal in the last uh, two years. I and, guess. and literature. And literature. We once had an interesting discussion about Jean-Paul Sartre. Yes, indeed. He's something, somebody I've been thinking about a good deal uh, recently. Yeah. And before we uh, get off on an element which is alien to art, per se, let's talk about some of the uh, various reviews you've uh, put forth uh, over the past uh, uh, couple of years. Uh, particularly, I want to talk about the, uh, the one you offered for uh, Frank Stella's new book uh, entitled Working Space. I've got a copy of it here, so I'm going to show our viewers. Uh, this is it, uh, Working Space by Frank Stella. Not a, not a large, uh, heavyweight book, but it, it's, uh, well, it's profound or it's audacious, according to you, in some cases, both. Uh, yes, more often, I think, audacious than profound. I think it uh, contains a good many um, interesting uh, insights, uh, sometimes even brilliant. But uh, finally, I would have to say it's a perverse reading of... Um, you, you, you used that word perverse before, but in, in addition to that, you began by saying that you think that uh, Frank Stella is one of the most thoughtful and articulate artists of his generation. You say that basically what he's offering here in working space uh, is his, uh, to, to quote him, uh, ins insistent defense of abstraction. Uh, but also... Uh, you go on to say, and I'm quoting you here, Stella has grafted his obsession with pictorial illusion onto an artistic movement whose chief concern with illusion was how to dispense with it. Here we have one of his uh, early early works, uh, Valparaiso Flesh and Green of 63, in which illusion had nothing to do with this image. No, indeed. I think that uh, Stella's obsession with, um, uh, with pictorial illusion um, came about really only later, uh, only after he found that um, the kind of minimalist art that he was engaged in the late 50s and early 60s uh, became something of a dead end for him. Yeah, and when we speak of minimal minimalism and its uh, short life, uh, we uh, can think of other short-lived uh, movements. Uh, I suppose all part of this transition from modernism to postmodernism and the, and the flashy manner in which it moves about through the art community. But with Stella, he always seemed to be right there in the forefront, ready, willing, and able to change as either the mood uh, suited him or as he found it necessary, maybe? Oh, indeed. He's uh, not, like nothing uh, uh, as a chameleon on a piece of plaid, I think. He's, he's been very uh, adept at moving with the, uh, the trends of, of the art world. Uh, is he opportunistic? Is it fair to say that? Well, I think that would be commenting on his motives in a way in which I would prefer not to. Yeah, but, you wouldn't uh, know anyway, would you? I'm afraid Without not. crawling into his skin. But certainly his art has uh, responded um, uh, with great alacrity to changes in the art world. When we uh, look at, um, at the next uh, 
the slide. Uh, it's entitled uh, Gur 3, a 19th, I'm sorry, this is the Paulus Potter uh, work entitled The Young Bull of 1647 in The Hague. And what uh, Mr. Stella is attempting to uh, prove to us here is that the next slide, uh, Leblon 2, uh, by him, has something to do uh, with uh, Paulus Potter's The Young Bull. If we can show the next one, here it is. Now, would you explain to me how Mr. Stella has convinced you uh, that this has something to do with his picture, Leb uh, or rather with Paulus Potter's uh, The Young Bull? Well, I'm afraid he hasn't convinced me at all. Um, I think that uh, the connection is um, uh, one of pure fantasy. I think he merely um, uh, took a, an idea he had and read it back into the tradition. I've tried to see composition, a relationship in terms of composition, in terms of draftsmanship, some kind of internal force uh, which may, uh, uh, I may react to spiritually. I can't I, see I it. think you could look forever, Richard, and you would, you would never find it. Well, I'm afraid so. And you say, for example, you say, he's inviting us to compare the situation of contemporary abstract painting with the situation of late 16th century Rome in terms of illuminating it, and then it becomes perverse, to use your word. He also even talks about graffiti. Uh, and uh, its relationship uh, to working space, even to the point of uh, finding it on the wall. Um, you know, uh, we have to talk about flatness, Greenberg, uh, uh, that, that whole movement in the 60, which, 60s, which just changed, and then his view of illusionism. You know, uh, onward we go with illusionism, and uh, if I'm not doing it, uh, might say uh, Mr. Stella, then perhaps some uh, relation, some justification therein is necessary. Is that, is that being a little too tough on Mr. Stella's working space? Well, no, I, I think he um, looked to pictorial illusion as a way of um, salvaging some uh, aesthetic substance for his works of art. I don't know whether one should really call them painting anymore since they are all um, uh, huge relief uh, sculptures, really. Um, and I think that um, one can see why he did that. Um, so oftentimes, uh, his works do have um, an aesthetic claim on us, but I'm not sure that uh, they are all that he cracks them up to be. Well, to sum up, Mr. Stella, you say he wants it both ways. The effect of reality without bothering with the commitment to truth beyond painting. A tough indictment. Well, uh, I think that it's an indictment that even Frank Stella would probably have to admit was true. Let's talk about another indictment, the indictment which has to do uh, with your review of Rosalind E. Krauss's book entitled The Originality of the Avant-Garde and Other Modernist Mists, a book which I have here. Again, I'll hold up for our viewers to see. And here it is, again, not a large book, but a book filled with pictures, mostly black and white, and filled with many contradictory ideas as far as you're concerned. Is that true? Well, I don't know that Rosalind Cross is necessarily contradictory, um, but uh, since the word perverse came up earlier, I think that it might be fair to apply that um, again to her work. You said originally she espoused a brand of formalist criticism which derives chiefly to mention our, uh, the critic we just mentioned, Clem Greenberg, who was in, at that time in the 60s opposed to structuralism. But now that structuralism is in fashion, so Ms. Krauss is a structuralist. Um, well, one can't help but suspect an element of uh, careerism uh, in, these, in these matters. But um, uh, again, that would, uh, to be, speculate too much on that would be, I think, out of, out of bounds. <laughs> it, her book is divided into two parts, uh, you, the modernist myths and then uh, a section towards postmodernism. And at the end of your review, you state that Ms. Krauss has provided us with new meaning for the terms critic and criticism, but you also say that in doing so, she has ignored and even discredited, discredited to use your word, the traditional value-oriented approach to art criticism, which she replaced with a discourse on abstract notions of critical methodology. Are you simply saying that she has no regard for valueism in art criticism? Well, indeed, I'm uh, simply paraphrasing what she herself says. Uh, value judgments, as far as Rosalind Krauss are concerned, are no longer the business of art criticism. Art criticism should, uh, in her view, concern itself uh, entirely with methodological matters. If we end up with uh, epistemology instead of uh, and, and methodology, we don't end up with saying what's good and bad. And we also don't end up with art. Yeah. 
Well, talking about art, let's look at the next, uh, at the first image, and this is Man Ray. It's a photograph, and um, it's interesting. It's interesting when we talk about about this because she likens photography to sexual intercourse. Do you not find that rather? Um, you mentioned the word perverse. Let's say abnormal some kind of abnormal eroticism which you use? Well, I think the whole point about Rosalind Krauss and the kind of criticism that she practices is that um, uh, there's an effort to inject every uh, moment of critical uh, discourse with uh, the erotic in order to give it a kind of, in order to give this kind of anemic prose uh, a um, some interest that it otherwise would entirely lack because it's, it's uh, so abstract, so um, really distant from the life of art. And obsessive? Uh, indeed, although I think that the obsession is always well under control. I mean, Rosalind Cross knows exactly what she's doing. I'm not going to argue with you about that because you wrote your own review, but I'm going to say I wonder if it is in control because you say if, if the reader is looking for insights into art, artists uh, and their related topics, uh, they're, they're going to be disappointed. If that's true, uh, they're certainly not going to be t disappointed if they're looking for abnormal eroticism. Uh, here, for example, uh, uh, when we look at Saul DeWitt, are we finding uh, a careful critical analysis uh, of uh, this floor piece? Uh, no, we're finding an epistemological fantasy and, <laughs> and a rather anemic one at that, I think. Why, why do you say that about, uh, about her review of Saul uh, Lewitt? I, I don't, I mean, she is one who has written about him before, and yet uh, in, in, uh, in her attempting to show the originality of the avant-garde, does it miss its mark altogether, and does Lewitt not fit there? Uh, what, what can we say about that? Well, Lewitt is merely uh, material for her critical mill. Uh, she doesn't care about the aesthetic substance of Saul Lewitt any more than she cares about the aesthetic substance of Jackson Pollock or Man Ray or any of the other artists that she writes about. Then, it, they're merely occasions for uh, the continuation of her critical game. Phallicism is something which is, is very important, uh, apparently, to, uh, to Rosalind E. Krauss. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if she wants us really to believe that uh, uh, photography is uh, in itself some has some relationship with uh, sexual conquest. I wonder uh, if it's true when you say that her writing has quote little to offer. Why she's fooled other people? Then is that what you're saying? Oh, I think she's part of a large industry, um, and uh, she practices the kind of um, writing she does very well. Uh, I don't know that she actually believes it any more than uh, you or I believe it. Is post-structuralism, uh, or even as we look at this Richard Serra installation, uh, are, are we being uh, fooled? Is that... Well, I think Richard Serra is a very interesting artist uh, at times, um, but I think the kind of um, interpretations that Rawls and Krauss offers us uh, of Richard Serra replace the art object rather than eliminate it. Mm. You say there are many false assertions in her book. The idea that art might move, might refresh, might enlighten us never occurs in the pages of her book. Nothing, nothing positive, only, only this perverse perversity? Well, she said uh, in one of the essays in the book that the, the, the whole notion of using the word spiritual in connection with art these days is an embarrassment. I think Rosalind Cross doesn't look to art for um, uh, aesthetic um, uh, substance, really. It's, it's, it's merely matter for her um, hermeneutical game. Is it not also part of the postmodern machinery? Indeed, I think that uh, postmodernism for her is precisely that movement which would seek to replace art objects as art objects and look at them as um, a kind of series of texts that are fair game for this critical play. Then I say that for one who reads this, her book and others, it's very difficult to sort out um, those plateaus which we have traditionally sought uh, in the history of art, uh, seeking traditional uh, uh, from avant-garde, seeking good from bad. Oh, indeed, I think she would want to sweep this all to one side as being hopelessly reactionary. Mm, there's a lot more to talk about, but we're going to take a break. My guest is Roger Kimball, a New York critic uh, who speaks his piece. He has plenty to say about art and other matters of culture, and with that, I'm just going to say that we should talk a little bit more about um, the larger scope of things, and by that I mean, in specific, uh, your uh, hmm, scathing review of the uh, art and architecture at the Equitable Center, uh, which you wrote for the new criterion in November of, of 86, 1986. Um, 
a tremendous investment in art and architecture for these new corporate headquarters in New York City. Uh, big names there, uh, uh, Edward Larrabee Barnes, Roy Lichtenstein, Saul uh, uh, Lewitt, who we just at all, and many, many more. Um, you said, uh, basically, and here we have the first uh, slide to look down on this, this great place, this large place. Um, you said that it is not art but money which echoes throughout Equitable's new halls. The building, uh, $200 million was spent on this building. We just only saw the lower half of it. Um, I'm wondering, is that also part of the postmodern emphasis? When we talk about Mr. Barnes, we can talk about postmodernism and some of his recent failures, which you accounted for in your... Well, I'm not so sure that the uh, investment of uh, money in art in the way in which it was carried out in the Equitable Center is um, necessarily part and parcel of um, postmodernism. Uh, I think it really lies more in the realm of real estate development. We see these huge arch forms both at the lower part of the building and at the upper part as we're seeing here. Uh, you didn't have uh, much to, you didn't think much of this building. You said it's one of the most pretentious and ungainly new, build, new buildings in New York City. You said the proportioning was stodgy and enervated. You said it rises in rear, weary shrugs and the entire skin of the building seems cheap, temporary, yes, that, replaceable. That, that, that all sounds about right. Yeah. That's, that's, well, how, could, how could these wonderful solid forms uh, and this harking back even to a Romanesque look, how could it possibly be so flimsy and so ill well, proportioned in the same way that a stage set is mm-hmm mm -hmm. do you liken it uh, to a stage set say to Hollywood yes indeed I think I in fact I did so in the in the course of the article I the architecture at the Equitable Center is nothing but a pastiche of of past styles a, a vague effort to try to be up with the times. You said there's no cogent architectural design, none at all. You said, for goodness sakes, that uh, even his recent uh, problems in architecture in New York City pales by comparison to the problems with this building. Is it that bad? Well, I think Edward Larrabee Barnes is a very distinguished urban architect, and he's done um, many good buildings. Uh, the Equitable Center, uh, unfortunately, um, is a disaster. Do you think that since the Whitney Museum is also headquartered and has space there, as a matter of fact, a lot of space, uh, we're, talking about, uh, we're talking about many hundreds of, of square feet uh, of space. Do you think that there's any relationship with the fact that Mr. Holloway is now chairman of the uh, Equitable uh, Center, is, is now uh, also named to the board of the Whitney? Do you see any... Oh, gee, again, any, I, I wouldn't want to speculate about that. Um, but uh, why one, not? One, you one, imply it. One certainly uh, notices the the the, the uh, contiguity. Yeah, I I, uh, I have to say that I, I I wonder when I see this kind of big dollars being these kind of big dollars being exchanged and where um, uh, where obviously the use of it brings instant success in terms of the art community. Um, if that isn't an awfully good PR package. Oh, indeed, and I think PR is the uh, uh, the raison d'etre of of the Equitable's venture into into art. Uh, I say venture into art. Really, it's it's a venture in to high-profile names in order to boost their own product, namely real estate. You know, there are many, many paintings there that you discussed in detail in your, in your review, but I would like to talk about this great one that's on our uh, screen now, uh, this 68-foot by 32, obviously a vertical mural by Roy Lichtenstein entitled Mural Simply uh, with Blue Brushstroke. Um, is it successful? No, I regret to say that... Uh, even for an artist um, as unaccomplished as Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, what did you say? I'm an sorry artist, for interrupting. An, ar an artist who is as unaccomplished as Roy Lichtenstein, this uh, probably marks a new low, possibly because it, um, of its overwhelming size. Do you think that Lichtenstein really is, is unaccomplished? He's a, one of the great pop leaders. Indeed, he is one of the great pop leaders. He is not, uh, in my view, however, a serious artist. It's obvious from your quote that his painting is nothing more than a species of garish holiday bunting, little more than an enormous, brightly colored cartoon. That is a strong statement. Well, I think Roy Lichtenstein has been turning out cartoons for uh, all of his mature career. Is he a pictorial ga gagster, as you say, who's, uh, who's rated comic books for his jokes? Well, he's rated comic books and the gestures of abstract art for his jokes. Uh, his paintings of brushstrokes um, 
uh, and uh, that sort of thing, merely introduce an element of parody and camp uh, into into modern art. Let's look at Sandro Kia's work, another mural, mural which is at the Equitable Center uh, in the restaurant. A sumptuous, sumptuous place. Uh, perhaps too sumptuous? Well, cheap? I... Cheap? No, it certainly is not cheap. I'm not so sure that Sandro Kia's work uh, um, is either a terrific work on its own merits, but certainly in the context of this uh, bar for the uh, restaurant Palio, it, um, it looks absurd. Uh, you know, when we try to make rationale that there is some relationship to the Equitable Center as a successor to the Rockefeller Center, you seem to think that that is, is just silliness, that it has no ever any chance of being the successor to the Rockefeller Center. Well, I, I think that it, it really doesn't, and uh, uh, the Equitable Center certainly is pushing that interpretation, but um, uh, Rockefeller Center was a very innovative um, uh, piece of architecture and um, public space for its time. And the Equitable Center really is, um, if anything, um, a kind of empty warehouse. A warehouse for people like Tom Hart Benton, who's America Today. Uh, big dollars spent for that, something from a mural from the 30s. Paul Manship's uh, art, uh, which you say uh, is, is, you say that he's second rate. Um, well, I'm afraid he is. I, the, they um, picked Benton and Manship because uh, they are both riding high um, these days in the crest of interest that... Uh, and revival. That, yes, sure. that revival of regionalist painting. And, um, uh, you know, if the names change tomorrow, I'm sure the equitable would change, uh, change along with them. If art turned out not to be the thing that sold real estate tomorrow, then uh, you can be sure that they wouldn't be handing out these lavish commissions. Is it true that there's a handmaiden effect then between big money and big art? I think the equitable shows. You this. know, the New York Times said every large-scale commission is worthy of serious attention. Um, do you do you really? Well, I'm afraid that the New York Times, this shows the New York Times uh, standards have, are not now what they once were when it comes to uh, criticizing uh, contemporary art. I used the word indictment before. That's a, a pretty serious uh, allegation when one says that really our only motivation is not pure. Our motivation is simply to bring people to our fancy place, uh, to heighten our uh, the, the space which will help us sell rent, and so on and so forth. Uh, do, do, you, do you think that that's a possibility in today's postmodernist market? Oh, indeed. I think the equitable shows that it's uh, more than a possibility. It's an actuality. I want to look at the last uh, at the Whitney Museum Gallery. Uh, the equitable center uh, provides a lot of space here. This is one of the galleries, which is one of four branches. Uh, as we look out uh, into an open area, visitors stream in that area. There's a big hotel nearby. Uh, Oh, sure, the visitors stream into the galleries and they stream into the boutiques. They don't hang out in the atrium too much, I'm afraid, though, uh, as the equitable hope they might. Um, but uh, it's not, they aren't there for the art. They're, they're just there for as tourists, cultural the, tourists. The atrium, Roger, is, is large and uh, it, it really has no sense of continuity from within to without, does it? It's complicated and problematic. I'm afraid the atrium is... Uh, a gigantic and very inhospitable box. You said that all of the interior, not just the atrium itself, has schmaltz, and it's a theatrical feeling of opulent stage set. Uh, the people who are involved with the interior decoration. Th this is really more true uh, in the executive dining rooms than in the atrium. They, uh, there's plenty of schmaltz in the atrium with Roy Lichtenstein, I suppose, but um, I was thinking primarily of the, the um, executive dining rooms where there are also a good deal of art in the top floors of the Equitable Center. If we see this kind of a problem with some, something which has received so much attention as the Equitable Center in New York City, um, do we see it as something reflective of our times? Alas, I'm afraid that we do. Uh, the, the union between art and big money um, has changed the art scene um, in very substantial ways and um, not, I'm afraid, for the better. But not all critics are addressing the issue quite as succinctly as you. Um, well, I'm afraid that is also true. Does that mean that they've fallen into the, into the abyss of this so-called uh, movement? Not necessarily. I think uh, one would have to uh, um, go critic by critic. In other words, have we provided a generation of critics who go along with the crowd just because it's popular?
Oh, indeed, I'm afraid that uh, that is true. Uh, many, many critics these days don't deserve the, uh, the title. Quickly, where is criticism going then? Well, uh, I wish I knew, uh, and I wish I could be optimistic about it, but more and more I'm afraid it's becoming a species of public relations. Yeah, I'm afraid you might be right. And I'll tell you what, I'll have you back again if you'll consent to that, and we'll talk more about it. Will you agree? I'd love to. Great. Well, Roger Kimball has been my guest. I hope you've enjoyed this edition of American Art Forum, and I hope you'll be back again next week to enjoy another edition. Until then, have a great week.